steps. Here comes the count. Thanks for joining us. We are Sunrise Community Fellowship, and we're so glad that you're able to check out our online services. Uh, join us while we go into our worship, and then afterwards for the message. Good morning, Sunrise. We're so excited that you're able to join us again for another day of worship.
tearing down those strongholds, everybody. So sing this with us. Sing these words with us.
and guidance through darker valleys. We pray all this in your son Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. Wow, guys, that was some amazing worship. Hey, if you were interested in giving, we have three ways to do that for your financial worship. You can give online, over the mail, or with the text number 84321. Now, on to Ron. Thanks, Matt, and thank you to the worship team for an awesome worship set. As always, welcome to Sunrise Community Fellowship. I'm Pastor Ron, and we are blessed to have our Sunrise family from coast to coast and beyond. Join us today for worship. Last week, we talked about the why and the how we can share Jesus with others. And let's recap what that was about. Um, we talked about praying regularly for opportunities to share the gospel. We talked about being watchful and thankful. We talked about praying for opportunities for others to share the gospel clearly. We also talked about be wise about how you treat outsiders. We talked about making the most of every opportunity and to ensure that our conversations are full of grace. But at the foundation of last week's message was that we must be authentic in how we live our lives as believers. Because once we proclaim that we are disciples of Christ, we must become his ambassadors. And if we don't live up to what God commands of us, all of Christianity is lumped in with our sinful actions, as I said, quenching the witness of the church. This week, we're going to focus on how to authentically live the life of a believer from the perspective of the book of Leviticus, chapter 19. When we hear God is holy, so we must be holy, we are really talking about being a real one. We are talking about being authentic, which really centers around the understanding that a holy life is not about earning our way or acting out of obligation. Rather, it is all about reflecting the holiness of God in how we live, in how we love others, and how we serve God. God. One of the young adults ministries I led in the past was called The Way. And it was, for all intents and purposes, a leadership development program and youth group on steroids. We had about 19 young adults in the program, and we went paintballing. We hit the rock slides. We went bowling, rafting, hiking, concerts, hockey games, just to name a few. It was a blast. But part of that commitment to being a part of the way was to be there for youth and children. As youth leaders, as chaperones, mission trip leaders, drivers, etc., etc. One night, we were having a planning meeting at one of our ministry volunteers' house. We were setting up for the meeting at the house, and uh, at that time, all that was there was the volunteer leader, a young adult, and me. Meeting time came and went, but only four more young adults showed up. 
Now remember, that group had 19 young adults plus five additional leaders that came and, got, that came and went through the program. And of that, we only had six of us. So, as you can imagine, I was disappointed by the turnout until one of my young adults said to me, well, Mr. Ron, at least you know who the real ones are because they're in this room. Real ones. Hmm, I had to ponder that. I had six committed and authentic folks who were all in and here to serve God as well as have fun. These six folks became the core leadership for my youth group and for the children's ministry that we served. All of them currently serve in ministry at their local churches today. For these folks, it was not about the talk of being a believer. It was about walking the walk. Now, when we talk about obstacles, we may think being authentic is difficult. And we would be correct in that assessment. Living out holiness in our day-to-day is impossible without God's grace. We are plagued with the delusion of self-sovereignty. This is when we mistakenly believe we are the source of power in our lives. This is the idol of self, and it plagues believers day in and day out. It is that voice that tells us that we deserve, we need, we want, what's in it for us. It's all about us. We come first. When we give in to these promptings, we find it easy to choose sin. If it provides us the instant gratification, and then when we have that gratification, then comes the shame. This is what God is trying to protect us from by telling us no or do not. It's not about control, but more so looking out for us. God knows our destructive self-nature and how the fallen world around us influences how we see holiness. This is why He gave us the law, not to be legalistic, but so that we could learn to love God and to love others. In the end, it's all about love and how to get it right. If we love God, we should have no desire to rebel against Him. And if we love others, we will have no desire to hurt or offend them. We must be holy because God is holy. That is to say, if God truly is your Lord, Our lives must reflect God's holiness. We must be real ones. Is it possible to be authentic believers through our own power? No, it's not. It's impossible, in fact. Can we be authentic believers with God's grace? And the answer to that is yes, because we serve a God that makes the impossible possible. With that in mind, let's look to Scripture to see God's example for us this week. Today we're going to focus on Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. This passage is broken into two sections. The first two verses are a call to holiness, and the second section expands on what it means to live a holy life. So let's begin with verses 1 and 2. I'll read. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Let's put some context to that. Let's break it down. To begin with, for some context, The people of Israel were slaves in Egypt for about 400 years. And then God redeems them from slavery through Moses. They travel to Mount Sinai. And the events from Exodus chapter 19 all the way through Leviticus occur 
at the base of Mount Sinai or on Mount Sinai. The mountain, to kind of shape this for you, the mountain is covered in smoke and fire by God. On a historical note, Mount Sinai had no volcanic activity, had no inert volcanoes, had no sleeping volcanoes, right? So the fire and smoke were not a natural occurrence. Rather, they were a supernatural occurrence. Supernatural coming from the Latin prefix super and the Latin word naturalis, meaning above or beyond nature. So no, we're not talking about the ghosts and ghouls kind of supernatural that we find in movies. We also can tell and call this a divine occurrence. So we find in verse 1 that the Lord spoke to Moses, which means this is a command from God. And this command or any command from God should be followed. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. All right. So, I mean, on principle, as believers, right, we should be in a position where we want to obey God, right? So this is what God commands, saying, Speak to all the congregations of the sons of Israel. And I want to note the importance of this statement. As as most may know, or some may not, uh, Abraham and Sarah had Isaac, right? Rebecca and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob wrestles with God and then is called Israel. He had 12 sons, which over the 400 years of captivity become the 12 tribes of Israel. I note this because I want to be clear. The Bible was not written for only one bloodline or one nationality. God doesn't say the sons of Israel. He says, the, he says all the congregation. You see, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, we read that along with the sons of Israel, a mixed multitude also went up with them. These folks were not descendants of the tribes of Israel. They were other conquered peoples. They were other slaves of Egypt. They were folks that intermarried with the people of Israel, etc., etc. The mixed multitude also became the people of Israel because they worshipped the God of Israel. This command was for any and all believers of the one true God. That means all believers. This is the Old Testament, and God is talking about all believers, not just the descendants of Israel. That means us. Think about that. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord God, am holy. God further commands that we should be holy, for He is holy. In today's culture and society, when we hear the word holy, let me ask, is it a positive or is it a negative? How often in our daily conversations with peers or co-workers do we hear the word holy in a positive light? In the media, we find that holy is often shown in a negative light, such as holier than thou. We also see the depiction or the concept of the super Christian or the super saint. These are folks that are on a spiritual plane that we will never reach. So why even bother? But let's be real for a moment. How many actual super Christians have we met? I can say easily for me, none. None. Because there's no such thing. Now, there are people who we may think are super Christians, but then we get to know them and we find out that they are human just like us. Holy does not mean being super spiritual or a super saint or a super Christian. Holiness is not something that we earn or achieve. We don't one day get a note, a notification on our phone that says, 
congrats, you have achieved holy status. That doesn't happen. Holiness is not super spirituality. It's about being all in. On reflecting God in every aspect of our lives, holy is what is right in God's eyes. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. This doesn't require us to to have some super spirituality or some idea that we can't achieve, but it does require you to choose a side, God's side or the world's side. In concept, everyone in this room is on one side or the other, and we're committed to our side. By default, you don't want to have anything to do with the things on the other side. So if you're on God's side, why would you want to do anything with the things of this world? And if you're on the world's side, why would you want to live by God's commandments when you can do whatever you want? And you can do your own thing. So when God says, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy, he is saying to us, I am dwelling on this side over here, and I want you to be with me on this side. Here's an illustration. Um, of how we live this out. It's not perfect, as most illustrations about God are flawed, but humor me uh, for a little bit. Any sports fans here? Anybody like sports? Yes? No? Maybe so? Okay. All right. I am a diehard Raiders fan. So there are some rules to being a Raiders fan. Now, I've been a Raiders fan since I can remember. As a matter of fact, my parents told me that Darth Vader was a Raiders fan, and that was it for me. He was, there was Darth Vader on the TV cheering for the Raiders, and I never looked back. Rain, shine, good season, bad season, didn't matter. So number one, rule number one, if you're a Raiders fan, you root for the Raiders. Number two, you don't root for the Chiefs. And number three, you don't root for the Broncos. You just don't do it. You cannot be a Raiders fan and a Chiefs fan because, as we know, they stole Marcus Allen from us, and that's unforgivable. I exaggerate here, right? Um, But I don't buy Broncos merch. I don't wear Broncos gear. If you buy me a Chiefs shirt, I will put it in my drawer, and I'll leave the tag on it, and it'll never get worn. But I won't throw it away because I value the fact that you gave me a gift. But, to be clear, I'm over here on the Raiders' side. And by default, I don't like the Chiefs or the Broncos. In my illustration here, you can't be a fan of both. And this is the point of the illustration, as flawed as it is, and the point of holiness. You can't live for this world and live for God. You can't be all about yourself and your desires, and be about God. You can't pour all your efforts into number one and be focused on God. So, how do we live on God's side? That's the question of the day. How do we become a real one? God expands on this for us in verses 3 or 4 of Leviticus chapter 19. So, let's continue with that passage. Every one of you shall revere his mother and father, and you shall keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourself cast metal gods. I am the Lord your God. Every one of you shall revere his mother and father. See, I'm going to break this down into three parts for clarity. So I'm going to start with every one of you shall revere his mother and father. This is um, interesting because we talk about respect and revering, and, and in, some, in some translations it says fear, but we're, we're talking about putting and caring for our parents even when they're vulnerable, even when they're not where the way we want them to be. But more of this, there's an interesting little nuance to the way this is written. Everyone you shall revere, every one of you, 
shall revere his mother and his father. There is a narrative in today's society and culture that the Bible disrespects, demeans, and treats women as second-class citizens. In my experience, most folks that say that haven't read the Bible. Instead, they've heard this opinion in the media. They've heard it on a podcast or on a YouTube video or on social media. But if you read the Bible, the Bible teaches us that we are all equals in the eyes of God. Not more, not one more greater than the other. Not one more greater than the other. In fact, the Bible makes the statement that is counter to the culture of its time, which saw women as property. So let's look at verse 3 again. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father. Notice, mother is mentioned first during this verse. And during this time, if you were property, you were not named before your owner, before your master. The Bible does this to make it clear that both are equal in the eyes of God. This command does not only mean to obey them, but it also means caring for them in their old age. This would mean for us to demonstrate love and caring for them when they become vulnerable, even if we believe they absolutely don't deserve it. Let's move on to, You shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. What is the Sabbath? It was a day to take a rest, a day to take a break, so that they could have time to worship God. We should enjoy the Lord's day. It should be filled with joy. The Sabbath should not be looked upon as just another day or just another obligation. Instead, it is to be cherished. Why was this so important? Let's look at the context. These folks gathered at Mount Sinai had just spent the last 400 years in slavery. Let me ask you this. How many days off do you think as a slave they received? Wait, even if they lived 50 years or 100, how many days do you think they got off, they had off, a day off, a free day, as a slave? The answer is easy. Zero, zip, nada. So how liberating would it be for these people to hear from their God that he commands them to take a day off? Imagine it. It puts a whole new perspective on the Sabbath. This is how it's supposed to be for us today. It is a time to recharge, a time to renew, a time to disconnect from this world and connect with God and our family. In Exodus 20, verse 11, we read, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. For that reason, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. God set a pattern for us. Work six days and rest one so we could spiritually, emotionally, physically recharge. The temptation to work all the time is real and it robs us of our intimacy with God and with our family. If we work all the time, think about what we miss out on. We miss out on the lives of our loved ones and we miss out on the joy God intended for us to experience weekly, if not more. Our kids are not going to stay little forever. And if we spend every day working, we're going to miss out on the wonderful moments in their lives that are meant for us to share and be there for. Let's look at do not turn to idols or make yourself cast metal gods. I am the Lord, your God. So it's not common in our culture to fashion idols anymore, right? While it does occur in some other countries and some other cultures, that still happens in other parts of the world today. 
In our culture, it is, as I said earlier, about the idol of self and breaking free from it so we can live for God. Let's add some context to that. Um, maybe that relates to the fashioning of idols. So, building an idol was a process. And it wasn't just about building something to worship, but it was also about displaying your success and your wealth. Idols were status symbols. So, the more money you had, guess what? The fancier your idol was. And if you really had money, you would dip your idol in gold or silver. Now, we are lucky that in today's society, we no longer have the need for status symbols, right? I mean, none of us are compelled to buy a car because of its perceived value, right? None of us buy clothing with a specific brand because of its perceived value. None of us buy shoes with a specific brand, excuse me, because of the perceived value, And I'm sure none of us buys a wallet, a purse, or a watch with a specific brand because of its perceived value. And the instant gratification that comes along with it. Right? That doesn't happen today. We don't do that, right? Some things never change, folks. Outside of the status symbol problem with idols, the idols attempt to place limits and control of an all-powerful God. Think about that. We are fashioning this idol in our image. So we're trying to shape God to fit into a box or into a statue or into whatever it is we are creating. And by having that, we have control. We can limit the all-powerful. We can shape God to be what we want Him. But the reality is, God does not fall under our control. He doesn't take orders from us. You cannot control the all-powerful God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourself cast metal gods. You see, an idol represents your deity. And your deity is what guides how you live and where your loyalty resides. Whether we like it or not, what we value, our kids value. And it's not about what we taught them, but what they caught from us. Think about that. It's not what we taught, it's what they caught. And what I mean by that is, it's not the talk, but the walk that our kids latch onto. So, if we value the idol of self and the things of this world, so will they. But if we value God, they will also value God. If we live for God, those around us will take notice of our authentic lives, of our authentic lives. They will be able to tell if we are a real one or if we're just playing the part. In this short passage from Leviticus 19, we see how we receive the call to holiness and begin to gain the understanding of how to live as God commands. We gain insight of God's intent for our lives. That holiness is not about rules. It's not about legalism. Rather, it's about getting love right in our relationship with God and others. We no longer need to cringe at the word holiness because it's not about being holier than thou. It's not about super spirituality. It's not about achieving impossible tasks on our own power. Instead, it's about living a life that reflects God's love and grace in our day-to-day grind. Holiness cannot be earned. It is a condition of the heart made possible by God's power and grace in our lives. When we live for God, we find that it's not our own efforts, but God's will working through us that makes us holy. It is because of God that we can become authentic believers. We must rely on God to reflect holiness through our thoughts, our words, and deeds. To live as 
authentic believers, we have to cultivate the relationship that creates the lifestyle. We have to repent. We have to surrender to God's will in our daily lives, and we have to share our faith. Embracing God's grace and love is how we live authentically, and our strength to endure the temptation to live for this world is found when we study God's Word, when we make prayer a habit in our lives, when we live for God first, and when we share the gospel with those God has placed in our path. Where to begin? It begins with surrender and repentance. What does that look like today? It's recognizing that your will is flawed and denying that what you want for what God wants you to do. It's not something that is easy to do. It's not automatic. We have to be all in. We have to be a real one. We struggle with this because it's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. And in the beginning, all we want to do is our own thing. So choose a side, God's or the world. It should be logical when you think of eternity. Everything of this world will fade away, and only God is infinite. Through the sacrifice of his Son, we can be with God and share in the inheritance of eternal life when we believe in Jesus Christ. Our text today announces the call to holiness. God's calling us to be all in, to be real ones. Where does this text challenge you? Is there a part of your lifestyle that you don't want to give up to put God first? Is there a part of your life that you don't want God to lead? Where does this text convict you Do you feel, when is enough enough? What else do I have to do? What else do I have to give up? Rather than asking, what more can I do to place you first in my heart, in my mind, and in my life? Maybe some of you need more prayer. Something like, Lord, Help me let go and offer up this obstacle, you fill in the blank, to placing you first in my life. Help me to surrender it all and to open every area of my life to you so that my life, my words, my thoughts, and my deeds reflect you, O God. Once you do this, you will have what it takes through God's grace to live in the Word and to grow in your faith. You will have within you, through God, what it takes to live a prayerful and holy life. You will have what it takes through God to become a real one, an authentic believer. So why wait another second? In these challenging times, we may find it harder to let go of our desires, our agendas, and our comfort but we must step out in faith and live like a real one. The result is beyond what you can imagine as we impact our families, our friends, and those God places in our path. Our witness and our ability to build the kingdom of God will increase in ways we can't even imagine if we simply live the life of an authentic believer. As we dare to go out into the world, we must rely and remind ourselves to rely on God. Because we are not what makes any of this possible. It is God. And all the glory of our efforts are going to Him. They're His to be glorified. My friends, come, let go of the desires of this world and surrender to God's will in your life so that you too can grow in faith, cultivate a relationship with God that gives you a genuine love of goodness rather than an obligation 
to do what is right. Step outside of your comfort zone and submit to what God has planned for your life today. Don't wait. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Don't make it something that you're waiting on. Make today the day you become a real one, an authentic believer, and rejoice in what God has in store for you. As we go out into the world today and we're tempted to go back to our old ways, as we feel the discomfort of dying to ourselves daily, as we face the hurt, the fear, and the uncertainty that exists all around us, let's challenge ourselves to say, real believers are not just talk, so walk the walk. Let's say that again. Real believers are not just talk, so walk the walk. This week, our prayer team, again, has received prayer requests from all over the country. And we just want to let those that have reached out to us know that we're praying for them. So I'm just going to mention some of these folks. We have, we're praying for Patricia, uh, Patricia from Florida, Sandra from Florida, Cynthia from Texas, Ophelia from Texas, Anna from New York, uh, Weiwei from Texas, Annette from South Carolina, Christina from Pennsylvania, Margaret from South Carolina, uh, Sakahi from Iowa, Margarita from Texas, and Arlette from California. And uh, Sakatahi, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. I, I did my best. Um, apologies for that. But we're praying for you. And uh, if you need prayer from, period, if you need prayer, reach out to us. Uh, you can go to our website. It's the first thing that pops up prayer requests, send one online. You can send it to prayers at sunrise-vv.org. You can call us however you want to get that. You can do it through our Facebook. Um, again, we're here to pray for you, and we want to do that. So um, let us pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to dive into your word, Lord, to help us understand that holiness is not some taboo idea. In fact, it's the opposite. It is how we should live. It is the reflection of you. Give us the understanding, the courage, the patience, the devotion to carry that out, to live as an authentic believer. Lord, help us overcome all the obstacles that we face or that we create to living for you first. Open our hearts and our minds so that we can open every part of our lives to you, Lord. We know that you just don't want to visit with us on Sunday, that you want to be there for every moment of our lives. So give us the strength, the courage, and everything that we need to open up every part of us to you. We ask this in your most precious name. Amen. Hey, this is Kedron, and our prayer team is faithfully waiting to pray for you. Whether it's stress, financial insecurities, or you just need to pray for a loved one, please send your prayer request to prayers at sunrise-vv.org. Again, that's prayers at sunrise-vv.org. Have a blessed week.